The canon tells us something about the people who taught in the time of the Buddha. And they fall into two main camps, what you might call them, absolutists and relativists. The absolutists are the ones who say they have a theory about the nature of reality, and their theory is true and everything else is false. The world is made out of atoms. That's one of the theories they had. Or the world is infinite. The world is not infinite. The world is eternal. The world is not eternal. It's a long list of views about the world outside. And what those views usually come down to is that it's impossible for human action to have any real impact on things, because the world, the nature of the world is set. The other extreme are the relativists, the ones who say, well, it all depends on how you look at things, or the ones who refuse to take any stance at all. And they make it impossible to do anything either, because if the world is totally chaotic, totally random, nothing is really set, nothing is really for certain, what are you going to do? Just kind of muddle around, or some of them say, well, grab whatever pleasure you can. Because there's no telling what's going to happen the next moment, the next day down the line. Just now we chanted the Buddha's first sermon. You notice that he doesn't start out with a, either an absolutist or a relativist stance. He's talking about courses of action. He says, if you do this, these are the results. If you indulge in sensuality, these are the results. If you indulge in self-mortification, those are the results, and neither get any really good results. He said, but there is, however, a middle path. And it's not the sort of middle path that was worked out by reasoning through or applying logic. It was simply by trying different paths and seeing what worked. So this middle path is the path that leads to the end of suffering. gives rise to vision, gives rise to knowledge, brings about peace, knowledge, nirvana. So that's what makes the Buddha's teaching special, is he found a path of action. He said, that's what's worth talking about, looking at what paths of action lead to suffering, which ones lead to the end of suffering. And then following the one that leads to the end of suffering, whether you like it or not. There's a poem in China attributed to the third patriarch. It starts out saying that the great way is not hard for those without preferences. Now, I don't know what the third patriarch meant when he said that, but if you apply it to the Buddhist approach to things, it's you do what has to be done, whether you like it or not. And this one sutta where he talks about what exactly is wisdom and discernment. And it comes down to four courses of action, the things you like to do that give good results, and the things you don't like to do that give bad results. Those are not hard. You avoid the things that you don't like and give bad results. You do the things that you'd like to do and give good results. It's very easy. The difficult issue and the one that's a real test of your discernment is things you like to do that give bad results and things you don't like to do that give good results. And that's where your preferences get in the way. That's where your preferences make it hard. So we have to learn how to look past them, because there are times in the path when it really does require a lot of effort. And you may say to yourself, I don't want to do this, I don't like this, and you wiggle around and you find all kinds of excuses. But in the end, what happens? Well, you don't get the results you want, and you've made it hard for yourself. 
or the things you like to do, and you say, I don't see what's wrong with this. And again, you make all kinds of excuses. And in the end, you don't get the results you want. And this is one of those areas where each person has to develop his or her own discernment. How are you going to get past your preferences? Because sometimes you have the other attitude, it's sort of the macho attitude. And there are aspects of the path that require just watching, being very patient, very still. And your macho side may not like that. So an important element of following the path is looking at the situation and trying out various things to see what works. And when you find what works, then whether you like it or not, you follow it. And when your preferences come up and complain, figure out ways of dealing with them, to put them aside. Remind yourself that your preferences have gotten in the way for a long, long time have gummed up the works for a long time, and how much longer are you going to side with them? And learn to look at them and see how they arise and pass away. And it's, it's very good to see how your preferences are not self. In other words, you don't have to identify with them. When you see something and a like, liking or a disliking arises, you don't have to get involved. And when the liking and disliking has nobody to play with, it goes away. That's like that other Zen conundrum, the sound of one hand. When the liking comes up and you don't respond, that's the sound of one hand. And once you get down to doing what just simply has to be done, the path gets a lot easier. In other words, you're not adding difficulties on top of it. Otherwise, it's, it's pretty manageable. Look at the elements of the path. There's nothing in there that's superhuman or requires that you exhaust yourself. If a lot of, in fact, a lot of the path is learning how to husband your energy. So you don't go on wasting it on unskillful things. When you don't waste it on unskillful things, you've got a lot of extra energy for the skillful ones. So on the days when it really does require that you sit for a long period of time to work through something, you've got the energy to draw because you didn't fritter away with other things. And particularly, you haven't frittered away with Trying to justify your preferences. Because this is the way life is. It's going to present you with things many, many times, whether you want them or not. And if you can make yourself up for whatever arises, it's a lot easier. I mean, the day is going to come when your death is going to stare you right in your face. Of course, most people don't want that. They run away and they try to wiggle out in all kinds of ways, and the more they wiggle, the worse things get. But when that comes, and you can tell yourself, okay, this is what I've been practicing for all this time, so let's do it right this time. Memories of your life will start arising at that point, and you'll see things that you're going to miss, things you're going to regret having done. You can't let yourself get involved with those. And this is why we sit here pulling the mind away from its distractions, because when you die, they're going to be monstrous distractions, and they're really going to pull you in their direction. And if you simply give in, that's going to have a major impact on how your rebirth is going to happen. And if you can maintain your calm center in the midst of whatever comes up, things are going to be a lot easier. 
bad things will come up, good things will come up. And you want to maintain your center. Don't get excited by the good things, don't get upset by the bad things. It sounds like meditation instructions, but it's also death instructions, how to die properly. Death is easy for those with no preferences. And this great way that we're practicing here is one aspect of it is getting ready for that fact. Life, of course, is a lot easier when you have no preferences. It doesn't mean that you don't have any goals or any ideas at all. It simply means that you do what has to be done. You sit down and your mind is a mess. You don't say, well, today's a bad day to meditate. I'm going to wait until some other time. You learn how to sit with a mind that's a mess and begin to see where there are little threads of the possibility of finding some peace in the midst of all that. When you do that, you've learned a really important lesson, much a more important lesson than saying, well, things are bad, I'm just not going to tackle them. That doesn't teach you any lessons at all. And the mind may not settle down as, as much as you like, but you've learned some important skills, how to deal with difficult situations. And you may say, well, I don't want a difficult situation right now. Well, there it is. What are you going to do? You do your best. And figure out what is the best you can do given that situation. And then there are the times when it's easy. The mind settles down and is still. And the mind says, okay, what's next? Let's, let's move on to insight. Well, maybe you have to get your concentration solidified before you're really going to be ready. There are many, many examples of people who've gotten a little bit of stillness and want to jump right for insight, and then they end up jumping right off the cliff. So wherever you are on the path, you do what has to be done. Don't let your preferences get in the way. And when you can manage that, then it's not a question of being easy or difficult. You just do what has to be done. And when you can develop that attitude that you're willing to do whatever has to be done, you get the results you want. And sometimes the results are better than what you ever could, could have thought of wanting. 